Hey everyone, this is Marika from Herosphere and I am so excited because I've got my friend Kylie Ann Turton here. Hi Kylie! Hello! <laughs> um, who is joining us from Karatha and for those of you who are from overseas, Karatha is uh, sort of far northwest of Australia and you think she's in the same state as me, we could probably just drive to each other and have a coffee but um, how long would that drive take Kylie Ann? Uh, it's about 14 to 16 hours. There you go. Yes. So we are doing this over Zoom just to make it a little bit easier. Uh, and today what we're going to talk about really is we're going to talk about pelvic organ prolapse. Kylie Ann has kindly um, offered to tell a little bit about her story and how she's um, managed to live a very fulfilling, uh, wonderful life and career with prolapse. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Kylie Ann, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing with your clients and a little bit about your background from a trainer's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am the owner and operator of the Movement Room. I'm also the founder of the Movement Mental Health Initiative. And what I aim to do is I aim to um, combine counselling strategies and techniques over adventure and movement-based activities to help women uh, reconnect to self, to nature uh, and others, uh, to get curious about the challenges, to move towards solutions, literally. Uh, spark curiosity, play more, experience more, and essentially just move from just surviving to actually living. Um, I'm a qualified personal trainer and a counsellor, and I have uh, quite a lot of experience in that pre and postnatal um, that realm as well. So that's kind of where I uh, focus most of my energy. So you have your studio in Karatha, but you also have an online business as well. Is that right? Uh, so I've got a studio in Karatha, um, a home studio, and I also I don't have, I don't take online clients per se, but I have an, a free online movement membership um, called We Move for Mental Health. Mm -hmm. So you can sign up and it's a full movement membership from pregnancy through to postnatal, um, no matter where you are in your, in your journey, postnatally as well. And it's just heaps of ideas, heaps of different workouts for you to essentially move your move and move mental health. So that's an amazing resource. And if you want it, you can jump on my website and, and sign up. Oh, you're awesome, Carly Ann. Oh, you're <laughs> awesome. And, and um, let's not forget that you are a mother of two very small children. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and how old are Constantly they? reminded. <laughs> <laughs> how, how old are your little at the moment? So Micah's just started kindergarten and she is nearly four and Luca is one. Wow, a year gone by already. I know. That's amazing. That's gone fast. So I met Carly Ann at um, the Women's Health and Fitness Summit in Melbourne. Uh, was that last year? The year before? No, it must have been the year before, oh, 2016, before, yeah. um, when Carly Ann was doing a presentation there. So she's also um, a speaker, really, at, at some of the fitness events. The, um, what's the big Australian one? I can't even think of it. Oh, Phylex, yes, yeah. yes. Um, so she loves to speak on these topics too. Um, just to get a little bit of a picture on where you're coming from, Kylie, and if you don't mind telling, telling us a little bit about your story and um, your story with prolapse and, and how that sort of evolved with time, that would be amazing. Yeah, no worries. So, um, I mean, my story is kind of split into two parts, I think. So um, prior to becoming a mum, I was actually diagnosed with severe depression anxiety and that's kind of what sparked my curiosity around movement uh, and how that plays a role in our mental health. Um, my psychiatrist sat, sat me down and was like, you know, I'm going to give you a referral to a counsellor, a, some antidepressants, and I want you to start exercising. And the only advice I took was to start exercising. I'm not recommending that, but that's what I did. But it, it took me on this eight-year-long eight journey to kind of get to where I am now. But when I became a mum, you know, I was prior to that, I was using exercise as a coping strategy to reduce my symptoms of my depression and anxiety. Yeah. So I kind of was like almost symptom free, I suppose, in a way. And then I became a mum and after the birth of my daughter, Micah, eight weeks post, um, I was already struggling emotionally and mentally, which I kind of knew that was going to happen a little bit. So I knew it was going to be a big change. I didn't quite expect to struggle as much, um, but I really withdrew from the help. And at eight weeks postnatally, I was diagnosed with, um, a grade two uh, bladder and a grade one uterine prolapse and it just sent me into this complete spiral um, like even worse than what I was before with my depression and anxiety and I didn't want to leave the house I cried a lot. Um, oh yeah, you would have been flagged as being a high risk client given your past history of mental, uh, mental health issues so were you not sort of under the care of people after the birth of Micah? 
No, because when you don't want to admit you have a problem, it's very easy to hide it. Okay. And if you where if you think about it, when you go and do your um, your personal checks with the midwife or yeah, the health nurse, you, so you can just you know you're given the the checklist and you just you know you write what you want them to see. Sure. So yeah. Um, so I can't remember where I was at now. Oh, as you were just saying it about the eight week mark, you were diagnosed with pelvic organ oh, with prolapse. Yeah. So um, being a fitness pr- professional and also being someone that uses exercise as a coping strategy for mental illness, I was like, what are my options now? And it just, it really, really got to me. And um, so I went on this huge journey um, mainly focused on the physical for a long time of, you know, okay, what can I do now? And, you know, where is my place in the industry? Um, you know, what can I offer? How can I recover? Um, and yeah, it kind of led me to where I am now doing what I am now. Um, and after the birth of Luca, I did everything that I could to have further, um, a further prolapse, which would be, you know, rectal <laughs> And unfortunately, uh, I ended up with that as well. But it was very different second time round yeah. because I didn't let it have power over me at all. And I just, I just got on with it. I just got on with life. And it, it led me to seeing the, um, the impact of what a physical diagnosis can do to the, to the, you know, mentally, to us mentally. And I became really curious around, you know, why are, you know, people with lesser grades of prolapse really, really struggling mentally um, versus someone like myself who has three prolapses of, you know, some would say, you know, more severe grades who are really living this fulfilled life. Um, yeah, so it's kind of just led me from like the physical and I was really focused on postnatal women and, you know, training pregnancy and postnatally and really focused on the physical to then just totally doing 360 and just being focused on the mental aspect. So, yeah. And then, and then seeing that impact of the mental aspects influencing the physical aspects as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. And I know we've talked about it before, the fact that the, the grades of prolapse don't always correlate with symptoms. And, and we will often see women who are grade one or grade one to grade two who are pretty significantly impaired in terms of their function. Mm. And then some women who will literally have organs coming outside of their body who will be aware, not even aware of it. They'll go into the doctor and say, I'm getting some friction there. And, and they're mm. like, my God, you, your organs are outside of your body. And it makes you wonder, like, what are the, all the other influences um, aside from the physical aspects? Yeah, I think it's the part that's not, you know, we go and see women's health physio for um, the physical symptoms, but who's supporting that emotional side? I mm. don't actually see anybody doing that. Um, unless we're taking ourselves off to psychologists and having those referrals made, which I think is needed because yeah. so many women are struggling mentally more so than the physical and it's just fueling the symptoms. It's crazy. You, just on that, in terms of diagnosis, so when you were told you had pelvic organ prolapse, what, was, what were the words that were used at the time and were you given any, I guess, um, idea of how that was going to impact your life? Was it... Were you told, you know, uh, well, no, you tell me. <laughs> um, so I was pretty lucky because I was working with, we're going to get to that in the next question, I think, but I was working with Ian O'Dwyer, who was really connected with Robin Kerr. Uh, and so I was lucky enough to be in contact with amazing professionals from Day Dot who had a different outlook. Uh, but if I hadn't had Robin and I hadn't had Ian, I would have been in the same situation. I definitely wouldn't be where I am now because when I did, I think I went through four different women's health physiotherapists before I even saw Robin. Uh, And, you know, it was a lot about, it was very limiting. Mm -hmm. I guess the language and the way I perceived the language was there was a lot of things I could not do. Mm -hmm. And that may have been my perception based on where I was at emotionally and mentally. it didn't matter because it was still a perception. And I guess, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of damaging language out there Mm -hmm. and it may not be, that may not be the intention. Yeah. But yeah, I think we need to definitely support women on how to interpret, you know, the information given to us. 
I, I 100% agree. And if yeah. you just take it back to other diagnoses, like, um, you know, if you, if you scan everyone over the age of 30, for example, you're probably going to find a disc bulge in the spine. Exactly. Oftentimes it's irrelevant, right? If you say to someone, you have this disc that's bulging out of your spine, you cannot bend over for the rest of your life. Or, you know, you might even just say, obviously that's very damaging, but you might even just say, oh, you've got a disc bulge. Now that client walks away going, oh my God, I've got a disc bulge. That sounds really bad. That sounds really scary. Um, I better protect that. And a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear. And we need to be, as health professionals, very careful in when giving that information, what is the follow-up information? What does that mean? Yeah. And when I was in that, that stage of, when I was in that real advocacy stage of raising awareness for, um, for prolapse and safe movement. And, you know, I was a part yeah. of the problem back then, you know, I was, I was inflicting fear on women that I was working with and it wasn't my intention. I was just so, I think, and I think that's kind of the stage that women go through when they are diagnosed and mm-hmm. go through this, like, it's almost like a stage of grieving. I don't know if you sure. see it, but it's like, yeah. you know, yeah. you're depressed and anxious and then you're, um, you know, you, it, I don't know. And then it becomes about advocacy and then, there's a lot you don't of want anyone else to go through what you've been through. No, absolutely not. And I think there can be a bit of blame too. It's like, oh, oh definitely. If I did some exercise in pregnancy. I probably brought this on myself. Or if my birth had been different and I had yeah. not had that epidural or yeah. if I had, you know, like we, we, we women, we blame ourselves all the time. We, we blame ourselves for everything. And we yeah, there's a lot it. of guilt around the diagnosis yeah. as well. But at the end of the day, um, which is what Robin helped me see is that, you know, I, We've lived a whole life before we get to this point. Yep. So we're never going to be able to pinpoint at what point we ended up with prolapse. I mean, I possibly could have been walking around with a grade one prolapse prior to even giving birth and that was just the straw that brought the camels back. Who knows? No one's going to know. And that's like what we're talking about. We, we still don't know a lot about it. Mm. Yeah. I think we're very early on in our journey of understanding pelvic organ prolapse. Um, but we were, you sort of um, talked a little bit about obviously uh, our mutual friend, Robin, who is amazing mm-hmm. women's health physiotherapist in Queensland and um, Ian O'Dwyer, who um, I met for the first time last year. And he's one of those people that you meet and you just hug because mm-hmm. he has this aura about him that is so beautiful. Like, I, do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, I feel like I've known you forever. I love you. Yeah. Um, what, outside of people like specific people what health and fitness professionals have you found that have really helped you on your journey just in general in groups I guess well I guess when I was first diagnosed and which is probably why I took the advocacy road online uh was when I I could not find anyone to relate to Mm. I wasn't looking for advice I wasn't looking for um someone to, I don't know, tell me everything was going to be okay. I just wanted to relate to someone. Yeah. And I, I could not find anyone that was a fitness professional at the time, since I'm talking like four and a half years ago now, mm-hmm. at the time, couldn't find anything. I mean, now it's, it's everywhere, which is great. Yeah. But so I didn't have access to these like um, positive, supportive Facebook groups, you know, mm-hmm. ones like Pop Fitness that um, Hayley Chevener has um, created. Um, so I guess my really, my go-to were Robin and Ian. So I was lucky enough to have already been trained by Ian and he was a major role in my healing journey. He, you know, we spoke about a lot about, you know, like that I'm not the diagnosis. Um, you know, this has, you know, this experience has come to me to organically evolve me to where I'm going to go next. You know, a lot of positive language around the diagnosis where I was able to eventually separate myself from the diagnosis Mm -hmm. um, and realize that this was you know this was this was meant to happen like I truly believe that I truly believe that that was meant to happen to me in order to push me to where I needed to be to have the impact on the world that I need to have Um, and then people like Robin Kerr I mean Robin Kerr I, I mean like I said I'd seen four people before seeing Robin and I had more success I actually flew to Noosa. I, I got married as well, so I didn't just fly to see. <laughs> I was like, that's a big call because it's about well. four-hour flight. No, you would have had to fly via. So I two hours to Perth mm. and then four hours to Brisbane and then a two-hour drive north. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, I had more success with Robin in 20 minutes of meeting her than I'd had with anyone. Wow. It, like, she's, that woman is like a magician. <laughs> I like, I, honestly, they're the two people that I, I will never be able to thank enough with words and I have never felt more grateful in my life for having them both in um, as a part of my journey for sure. But then there's people like, you know, um, a good friend of mine, Dan Dixon, who I did my uh, mentorship with. He was a really good support for me. My mentorship with OD um, a year before falling pregnant, I think it was, or not even actually, it was probably a couple of months. Um, and Michelle Wright, you know, played a huge role in my healing journey as well. So I think my advice there is to not be scared to reach out to people that you think can help you get to where you need to be. Yeah, and it sounds like for a lot of people, it might not be that first point of contact. No. First point of contact. It might be that you don't have that connection or maybe don't, no. don't, yeah, don't have that feeling and then it's time to move on, find someone else, reach out to someone else. Absolutely. Like, I, yeah, I, I never, yeah, and I would always say don't feel obligated to keep seeing someone just because you've seen them. Yeah. Find someone you really connect with emotionally and that's where you're going to have the most change. Mm. Cool. Um, when you first learned about prolapse, where did you go to learn more about it? Did you read books? Did you go online? Did you go Google crazy support group? Yeah, this is how it went. I Googled and then I contacted Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Robin was so awesome. Like she would just, can you, when you're first diagnosed and you just kind of leave with the diagnosis, it's just, it's overwhelming and you don't know what it means for you. And it, you become, I don't know if I'm speaking for everyone here, if I'm overgeneralizing, but you become obsessed. And so you're constantly looking for answers. Mm -hmm. Do I think that's a good way to go in hindsight? No. Um, but like I said, I had the support of someone like Robin who could just go, okay, this is what's happening. This is the reason why, do, do, do. done out of my mind, didn't have to think about it anymore. Or I had a tool. She's good at cutting through the crap. I love oh, Robin. She's, um, she's, she's a very kind person. Like she's a loving person, uh, but she's also, she's just no bullshit. No. <laughs> I mean, really, like, is that what we want? Do we want people bullshitting to us? No. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and the other thing I did, which is the advice of OD, which is like probably the, was like, one of the biggest turning points in being able to separate myself from the diagnosis um, is I kept a case study on myself for 52 weeks from the birth of Micah to a year post. Oh, interesting. And I kept things of, um, you know, what had happened during the day, like significant things or not, whatever, um, how it affected me emotionally, how was I feeling, how to deal with it, how did that show up in my physical symptoms? And that's where I made that huge connection all the way back then was that it didn't maybe, the magnitude of that didn't maybe hit me until like now. Um, but yeah, there was always a correlation, always. It was always, it was driven from an emotional to a physical symptom. And then it could like just continue spiraling. That's and interesting. I just think I, I sometimes make my clients um, do a little calendar and it's a bit similar, but I like yours because you get a little bit more detail, but I'll get them to talk about like what their symptoms are like on that day, but how much sleep yeah. did they have the night before, what their stress yeah. level is like, how much physical activity they did that day, just so you can, because you, you can really sit there and get bogged in day to day, but not really actually be able to reflect because you're, you're too emotional and mm. um, it's very hard to look back in retrospect and think, well, what did I do yesterday or the day before and how was I feeling? And, um, but I, yeah, I like them to track that just to see, yeah. like you said, how the emotion affects the physical symptoms um and the two biggest things were that was stress and fatigue they were always they were always the cause i mean i was waking up i don't know six to eight times a night for two years <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, like severely fatigued to the point where i was like a crazy person so obviously that's going to have an effect on the tissue in the pelvis and but then also mentally big time yeah. yeah. So one of the things we talked about a little bit before, and I think it's probably worth mentioning as well, Carly, Ed, is just we were talking about um, there, there are some real positives about being in Facebook support groups. Like they can be 
so lovely for women because you feel like there, there are other people out there who are like you. You can also read um, s- sort of inspiring stories and things like that. Some Facebook groups can be a little bit more negative, dare I say, and can lead to more of an obsession. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in my personal experience, I, we were talking about this before, I remember I joined one of the um, groups when I was wanting to learn more about how to help my clients with prolapse. And I wanted to really get a better understanding of what they were going through. I, within about a week, felt I was, I was so distressed. I was very distressed for these women and what they'd been through. And some of them had had really significant surgery and mm. relationship breakdowns and all the rest. But because I knew that I had prolapse as well, which I wasn't really symptomatic at all, mm. the more time I spent in this group, I was starting to feel it. And I remember I was in tears. I was very emotional. I remember ringing up my husband and saying, oh, my God, my prolapse is so terrible. I can feel this thing coming out of my body. Da, da, da. And I actually ended up, yeah, you're laughing at me, aren't you? But no, but it's serious because I, I became so invested in what was going on down there. I couldn't get, I could not get my head out of it. And the more time I spent in that particular group, the more I was aware of my symptoms, which I'd never been before. And I had to kind of go, what the hell are you doing? Get, get out of there. It's not actually good for you. Go and move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do stuff. And I actually was so much better for exercise, exercising yeah. rather than reading and absorbing myself into that in, in that environment mm. i think um one of the biggest things i've seen um in some of the groups is a lot of women haven't connected that they use exercise as a coping strategy to remain mentally well mm. and then when they're given this diagnosis that's potentially um going to affect the way that they once moved they become severe, very distressed yeah. very and with like you know with good reason if you don't have help letting you see how you can um how you can still elicit the same response maybe moving a different way Mm. like we're not it's we're not really given like we're inside this box where we're just seeing lots of negativity when there's all these solutions outside of, but we're just boxed in and we can't see it. We need someone to help us break out of that. And that's where I use movement to help people kind of make some little alleys to get out and see some solutions. So with those groups, um, yeah, I find that people become, they become giant prolapses walking around. Yeah. They, forget that they're uh, like maybe they don't forget but they're they're ruled by the symptoms of what's going on physically and then the on flow effect i see into relationships um and i've experienced this myself yeah absolutely definitely relationships um sexually which is it's huge you know um i'm only kind of just coming out of that now mm-hmm. that's something that's definitely not spoken about enough and we don't have enough guidance around i actually ended up seeing a sex therapist Yep. Um, and she helped me a lot um, in that area. Um, you know, the relationships with our children because, you know, when we're so distressed, the way we react to normal situations is sometimes not always the best. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, I just don't think we quite understand by becoming so focused on the physical how, how that affects our bigger picture. Yeah. So um, I think this, that probably leads on beautiful, beautifully to my next question, which was what do you think has helped you the most in getting you from point mm-hmm. A to where you are now? And, and I'm assuming you're, you, you're still on your journey. You know, you're, we're always on a journey of learning and um, self-discovery and everything else. Yeah. But what has been the biggest you know, change? What's given you the best change, do you think? Look, I think the biggest thing, and I talk, I talk about it a lot, is like, pro, you know, I've moved from prolapse to purpose. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I got grateful for my diagnosis and my experience, that's when things shifted. Um, until you can get to that point, it's going to be a burden. Yeah. And it's going to continue to rule your life. Um, I got asked, I don't know if we've 
it's probably a question a bit later on, but, you know, asked, you know, what was the biggest thing to help you become symptom free? And I was like, I'm totally honest with you. And it probably isn't the best advice without me actually coaching you through it is I stopped giving a fuck. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they were like, well, how did you get to that? And I was like, look, that's a journey that yeah. I go on with you and figure that out with you. Um, I mean, it's been, the reason why I do what I do is because I've been on that myself and I've experienced it on the ground and it's a lot of work and you need a lot of support mm. but you can get there and you can start living your life. And that's not a switch you can just flick, is it? Absolutely not. I've done a lot of personal development. I've seen a lot of different professionals. Um, but I think the biggest thing is getting great is that gratitude. That's like one of the most powerful um, positive emotions to, to create change within your life. Um, and if you can't see how an experience has led you, it's what it's trying to teach you and the message it's trying to give you, then it's going to, you're going to keep running into it until you see it. Why me? So Getting out of it, why me? See that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I know that I, I can imagine some people sitting there right now going, really, you want me to, you want yeah. me to feel grateful for this Carly Ann? Like seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, Woo-woo. <laughs> yeah, you fluffy woo-woo person. Um, how long do you reckon that took you to get to that point? Um, well, how far am I post-diagnosis now? So, what, four years? Yep. So I'd say three, three and a half years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you'll know, you'll see it in my... The other thing too is that you'll see it, you can see it in my journey is that I, the more I've talked about it in presentations, in advocacy, in, it, it's really interesting. The more I talked about it and the more it was in the forefront of my mind, the more symptoms I had. Yeah. And the more it kind of ruled me. So I, um, my last presentation on it where I actually was like full focused on it and like making my presentation some perfectionist. So it takes me like six months to put something together. Um, <laughs> um, my last presentation on prolapse was the Women's Health and Fitness Summit when I was pregnant with Luca. So yep. 2016, as soon as I stopped talking about it so publicly as well, things started to change. I hope I don't make you symptomatic now, Kylie. No, 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 it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're talking about it. Um, yeah. I, I know a lot of people would be interested to know what exercise looks like for you at the moment. Um, for anyone who's on Facebook, which presumably most people are these days, <laughs> I really highly recommend you follow Kylie Ann and I'll put the links below because I, I love watching your videos, um, when you, especially when you do the, the, the little um, sped up uh, ones. And you can, I, oh, yeah. I watch your, your circuits and I know that some people would watch that and think, hey, is that prolapse friendly, Kylie Ann? Is it so? Whatever that is. Um, <laughs> now, tell us about what movement looks like for you at the moment. Oh, look, nothing is off the table for me. So I will, like, I went back, I tried CrossFit last year um, and I was amazed. How was that? I was capable of. I was like, I've never really moved traditionally, and so I wanted to prove to myself that I could do this traditional strength work mm -hmm. um, and I could do it. Did you enjoy it? Did you get a bit hooked? <laughs> I did enjoy it. I, I'm not doing it this year, but I did enjoy it. I really wanted to experience what other women would experience when they're working with prolapse, but when they're moving with prolapse as well. Um, look, I do a lot of loaded movement training. So I use Viper a lot. I use um, vibration accelerator training, so power plate. I do use TRXs, I use all kinds of different tools, but I, it comes down to using the ODM movement movement philosophy. And so all of my sessions are based around OD's um, philosophy mm -hmm. and there's lots of variety. I never do the same thing twice. Yeah. I want to have fun. I will never go in with a program. I'll go in based on how I feel that day and then I make, and then I move. Yep. So um, I'm never really structured into anything. I love being creative. I would like, I will write something down and then each set will be totally different because I've like sparked all these ideas. But I think that, that's important for me because I always need to. I get bored really quickly too. We're, we're ADHD yeah. exercises, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. I like, to be, I like, I need to, 
I need to stimulate that like creativity and remind myself that my brain still works now. <laughs> <laughs> Even though she's had two hours sleep, she's doing, really yeah, well. yeah, she's doing so well. <laughs> Um, and I essentially just, I just go by how I feel. So if something doesn't feel right, then I honor that and I just move on and do something different. I don't push through it. I don't, um, beat myself up about it. It just might be that day. It's just not feeling right. Do you use a pessary for exercise or for general? Um, I do it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I was to go back and play something like basketball, uh, I would pop it back in, mm -hmm. um, just for a mentally, like a, it feels like a safeguard. Yep. Um, uh, but no, I haven't worn it for a while. I actually found that um, it started to make me leak. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I pulled it out um, and I spoke to Robin about that and she said that can like kind of kink the urethra. So I pulled it out, let everything settle and then realised that I didn't actually need it. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, if you were to give one piece of advice to women who have been given a diagnosis of yeah. pelvic organ products, what would it be? I have a few things. <laughs> <laughs> one piece? Okay, you can have more. <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing is the more that you fear it, the more it will own you. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to separate yourself as a human being from the diagnosis because you are not the diagnosis. That does not define you but you, you can make the choice to let that diagnosis define you. Yeah. And I see it all the time and I've been there myself. Um, it's okay to feel shitty about it, but it's not okay to let it limit your potential mm -hmm. because it'd be a fucking waste. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasted a lot uh, in that space and I, I don't want people to sit there forever. And I, because I, I can can see that pattern playing out with a lot of people around me. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is don't compare your healing journey to someone else's. Because Amen. Yes. We are all so different. Yes. You know, we talk about it all the time. You know, we're here. We are here for a reason. And so why would that be different with anything else that plays out in our lives? Yeah. You cannot compare your symptoms, the way it played out to yeah. someone else. Um, 100%. And on that, I would say don't get caught up in trying to revert, reverse or heal your prolapse. Mm -hmm. Just look, it may happen to some people, but don't let that be your driver. Mm -hmm. Because again, then you get caught up in that cycle of, okay, well, it's not healed yet. Okay, so you're just going to, you know, you're just going to keep staying in that yeah. cycle. You're not going to get out of it. Yes, yeah. that a lot. I see that happening a lot as well, and I've had conversations about that with people. And that can be very life limiting. Absolutely. Um, and you just stay in that. I'm just going to survive, and you pin happiness on that healing. Have you seen that? Yeah. Like you pin the happiness. I'll hold on to. I'll, I'll wait until this is. Yeah, yeah, and, and then, then I'll, I'll be my happy. Life. And then I'll be happy. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, who's to say that if you did? Here we prolapse. I personally don't think that that happens. I think it's probably the things that are healed is more of like a laxity in the tissue, like, and then it, you know, after hormonal set, hormones settle down and stuff, things go back to normal. But that's just my my um, take on it. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing is, I uh, love saying this is that if you have prolapse, you are not prolapse. Just like you put that on a t-shirt. I know. But it's just like you have fingernails, but you're not fingernails. It's like you have fat, but you're not fat. Yes. It's that simple. Yeah. Lovely. I have a personal question for you. Where do you see yourself in 10 years, Carly Ann? Oh, this can be personal me. or professional. Well, I, I did a 10 year plan the other day. Did you? <laughs> so I see myself massively disrupting the fitness industry <laughs> and how, and the role that we play in the mental health sector in Australia. So I see us um, in a really unique position to really impact people that are suffering. And um, I see that there'll be more cross referrals between fitness professionals and mental health clinicians. And, yeah. um, I, and I see that, you know, we're gonna move from this sanity way of moving to, I'm um, sorry, vanity way of moving to be more about sanity 
and yeah. it being about you know moving for moving your mood moving for mental health and you know a lot of people will wake up which will be amazing yeah um and i like i guess in like on a business um side of things i hope to be down south somewhere living on like some properties i love obviously nature and i'd love to immerse myself in that more um offering different types of movement adventure counseling uh wow. you know, who connect back to nature, self and others, but doing that really immerse myself in doing that um, and really helping people um, in that aspect. I'm a little bit limited where I am at the moment, mm. but I see I'm just building, like I'm just building and it's going to be. Yeah. You're just, you're writing down all these ideas, right? You're making your plans. <laughs> I love it. And I'll come visit you because that's so much closer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think it's, uh, yeah, no, that, I think that sounds amazing. And I think for many of us, it's um, thinking, of course, of myself personally again, but <laughs> and clients too, but, you know, it can take us a while to figure out where, where exercise fits in our life and, and what the meaning of it is. And um, in the last few years, I've really began to appreciate how much better I feel being in nature and hiking, camping um, and holidays for us, my friends take the piss out of me all the time because I don't go and sit on a beach and do nothing I can't like yeah, I want to yeah. snowboard I want to hike I want to yeah. like, I love doing stuff and but yeah. doing stuff in nature and um, I realized it's taken me a long time actually to kind of figure out that I need that yeah. and if I don't have that I'm actually not a nice person to be around um, and I do martial arts and I like punching and kicking things yeah. and again if I have a couple of weeks off taekwondo you don't want to be around me because I'm not a very nice person <laughs> Yeah. I need, I need it, and I, but it's taken me a while to figure out actually that that is who I am and that is and what I need. We need more professionals helping clients figure out where does movement sit, what do they want to do, how, what brings them joy, like not just this like grueling hit the gym, doing squats, like whatever it is, like that may not fit for everyone. So it's trying to figure out what does a client want? How is it going to help their body become the vehicle to live out their life where they're like living, doing things that they've always dreamed of? Like I prescribed serious. painting this week. Hey? I prescribed painting this week yeah. on our clients because it's, it brings her so much yeah. joy and she's like, yeah. oh, I don't have enough time. I'm like, your physio says you have to do painting this week. It's on your exercise program. I'm writing it in your exercise yeah. program. It's yeah. doing movement. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Looking outside the box. Yeah. All right. So we're going to finish up. Like, come on, stand up, Carly Ann. Yep. Here we go. It's mine. Woohoo! Mine looks backwards. <laughs> so is mine. I promise, I promise it's the right way around. <laughs> Tell us about move, move for Mental Health. Oh, this is my baby. So Movement Health is an initiative to empower men to move, play, experience, and explore move more to boost mental um, well-being or to reduce the symptoms of a mental illness, thing, particularly depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it aims to um, raise awareness for movement as a powerful coping strategy. Uh, it's advocating for movement to be prescribed by mental health clinicians. Um, to help people on their journey um it's also to get people to start getting out in nature more and adventuring and exploring and experiencing so that they move from that surviving you know like you know what i mean just getting through the day yeah, yeah. You know, just the daily grind to like like living like living life. thriving thriving yeah as well um and then also the shirts, um, I saw these shirts, they're not online at the moment, but they will be very soon again. But these are to advocate for people to speak up, start conversations and seek help. Mm. Um, and they've been doing that and it's been amazing. And this has had, this is one of those things that has just flowed and has just become something way bigger than me. And I could not be more grateful, humbled and proud of it. Um, Cause yeah, you, put the, you put the picture up of these t-shirts and everyone's like, where do I get one? I want one. I and I was like, Kalyan, I want one. Where do I buy one? <laughs> yeah. I've got them in, um, uh, they're in New Zealand. They're like nationally, they're in the U S it's, it's been epic. And I just hope uh, this year is about building that and getting that message out there more because yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, I've, I've seen it help people, um, speak up and ask for help when they've never felt comfortable to before. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. 
And you've got a couple of hikes coming up too, okay. right? So um, in September, I've got Borneo. So that's my international hike this year, which is going to be amazing. Details have just been released. Um, so that, that's going to be a, like a pretty epic experience. I'm really excited <laughs> for that one. And then I've got two Cape to Capes. So yep. down um, in Margaret River. So that's 135 kilometres hiked along the coast and in the Karen Forest. And it's just so life-changing. Like last year's hike was just, I can't even put it into words. It was just epic. And um, we're raising funds for the Gidget Foundation. I'm actually an ambassador for the Gidget Foundation and they provide psychological care and support for men or mums and dads. Beautiful. And we raised 35 nearly $35,000 last year from one hike, which is, what? Was, oh, I just That's like, amazing. I know, like I, I, we did a fundraiser here in Karatha and we raised six grand just that night. I was with like less than 50 people and I like literally cried all night. I was so grateful. I've never experienced gratitude like I have and it, it creates so much change in my life since starting this initiative. Um, I'm I, can, I can hear you getting a bit choked up talking. Oh, yeah, about it. I love yeah. it. <laughs> it's all about business, like business with purpose for me. Yeah. Um, it always has been. Um, but the $34,000 helped kickstart the Gidget Foundation Start Talking program. So we actually have raised enough money to help nearly 35 families for a whole year with quality telehealth psychological care. So wow. that was like we didn't realize that until the end when we got told by the CEO and um yeah it's really cool when the CEO uh, Arabella is actually coming on the um one of the hikes that's amazing um, and and I'm thinking you know for those that don't understand how remote some areas in Australia are like telehealth is becoming incredibly important and valuable absolutely we there's just a um article in our paper up here where we've got a mental health facility that's actually been put on the back burner and all the mental health clinicians and psychologists and counsellors were just like, we are heaving, like we are like at capacity. Like yeah. one of the um, clinical sites that I refer to, she's booked out for three months in advance. Wow. Like just that's, I don't think people put enough, um, we don't respect enough the power of isolation and being remote and away from family impacts families um, mental well-being yeah and whether like, our town is full of young families so you can only imagine yeah yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. Well, look, I'm going to wrap it up there, Kylie, because I reckon you and I could talk for about three days. Um, but I have so enjoyed, I've so enjoyed talking to you and thank you so much for being so open and um, talking about your experiences and all the amazing things that you're doing. And um, thank you for all that you do. You're an incredible, oh. incredible woman. Well, I'm proud to have you as my okay. friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. All right. I'll, I'll put all Kylie Ann's links in the, um, in the blog as well. So people want to follow her on Facebook, join, uh, learn more about, the movement room and move for mental health initiative and donate to can people donate to the gidget foundation they will be able to very soon awesome and yeah. go to borneo if you want to go to borneo because that'd be Absolutely. pretty cool love to have you in borneo <laughs> thank you kylie thank you